work now? Yes? Okay, awesome. So, good morning. Uh, and welcome to our amazing presentation about eBBR, um, the embedded base boot requirements. To understand what eBBR is and to figure out what eBBR is there for, um, we first need to dive into these two pictures there, into what UEFI and UBoot is, and that's why I'm coming first, I'm going to talk about this, and then Grant comes later. But who are we? So I'm Alex Graf, I'm a really most a virtualization developer that happened to dive into ARM a couple years back. Um, and I basically started at SUSE, the uh, open, open SUSE uh, ends less ARM efforts, so that we now have a distribution that actually runs on ARM systems. And with ARM, obviously, comes embedded. Right? Uh, thanks to that, I'm now maintainer of the U-Boot Raspberry Pi port and uh, the U-Boot UEFI port, and that's exactly what this presentation is about. And uh, frankly, I think I am in the past life, I was a Linux kernel developer and maintainer. Uh, I managed to run away from that, and then instead I'm now maintaining device respect and running around doing various ARM things on, on ecosystem. <laughs> so the first question that everybody's asking really in that is, why, why would I even care about UEFI? We had an embedded conference, right? Um, why, why do I even talk UEFI? Um, and the, the, the answer is actually reasonably easy. If we look at the market, um, usually if you have an embedded device or any SOC these days, um, it comes with a boot drum, and that one's fixed. So the vendor just put that boot drum in, that's the way you boot, right? You have your boot drum in, in your system, um, which then goes in and runs your firmware. And that's the traditional picture that an embedded developer depicts of himself. <laughs> You have this one entity that you get from someone else, and then you have this other entity that goes in and creates your firmware, and firmware is pretty much everything your device does. Well, the world isn't as easy. Um, firmware actually is not just this one single piece that it used to be. It by now is a lot of different components. You have your bootloader, you have your device tree, you get usually a Linux kernel inside, including a full Linux operating system, lots of user space in there, and your application that does things on top. Right? And a lot of these things require very in-depth knowledge of their technologies, which means you tend to want to split those up into different tenants. Not everybody wants to have all of these pieces come from a single source. You may want to have your hardware vendor be responsible for your firmware. You want to have your operating system from somebody completely different and then potentially task five different companies with different applications for your device you then produce. So this is the shift in the world we're seeing, um, in, in the embedded world that we're seeing these days. And uh, whenever you have these boundaries, you do need to have a standardized protocol between the different entities. So from a boot drum to firmware, that's easy, right? That one's standardized by the SOC, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, from Linux, from Linux to uh, the application is also easy. We have the Cisco interface, we have lots of um, standardized interfaces in Linux to that basically give you a common ground for everybody to work against. The big problem is that one. Right, what do you do? How do you pass the, the boot flow on from firmware that comes from, from a hardware knowledgeable person to an OS that comes from somebody who does OS as well, like us, for example? Um, I guess you've seen XKCD's comics before. The problem is, if you want to standardize on something, don't invent something new. <laughs> We've done that in U-Boot before, when uh, people went in and said, oh, uh, we have a problem, we need to do standardized boot, let's invent yet another configuration file format that uh, people can then use to standardize their booting on, and that never happened. Because, obviously, uh, the other ones were still around, so people then just use one more standard, which uh, just hurts the whole ecosystem. And what we do have in the ARM server world <coughs> is UEFI, um, so UEFI is the obvious answer to what protocol do I want to use to pass things on from U-Boot or from any boot environment really to my operating system because then I only have a single interface to care about. But who in this room knows what UEFI means? Okay, so who believes UEFI is basically synonymous with Tiano Core, EDK2, the huge bloats you have on your PCs. That's one, all right, two, good. Um, it's not, UEFI is a spec. 
New FI is the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, and the I in it really means an I. It really is an interface. It does not say anything about the implementation. Tiano Core is the reference implementation for UEFI, but that doesn't mean it's the only implementation because by now we have a second one. And while Tiano Core usually comes in your PCs and is a, this a gigantic beast that is a couple of megabytes that you don't really want to have on an embedded system because it takes about five minutes to boot. Um, and that's not just because of the UEFI spec is very innocent in that it's all implementation details um, that go even in pre-UEFI phases at times. Um, but what makes those two implementations so different? Right? So one of the biggest issues for me with the whole EDK2 Tiano Core by code base is the coding style, to be honest and quite frank. Um, it sounds like a very unimportant topic, but it's, it is actually really dear to a lot of us in this room, I would assume. Um, because looking at code that is written in a different coding style is just harder, which means you don't find bugs easily. If, you, if people have a different mentality on writing code, it basically means you cannot follow the coding and the, the program flow easily. So it just is very alien to a lot of people. Basically, Tiano Core follows everything that makes Windows coding style Windows coding style. Right? It, it has these uppercase things. This is not a, the best example, but it's the shortest one I can find. This is an example of how Tiano Core code looks like for a very simple function. And you can see all the weird multi-line things and uppercase, all uppercase uh, num the, the definitions for, for variables and so on. Uh, lots of camel case too. Uh, whereas U-boot code uh, traditionally follows pretty much the Linux coding style, and it's just easy to read. Right? It, it basically is the way you would usually write things in an embedded environment anyways, if you're a Linux developer. Another really pe big, big piece of uh, difference is how do you connect two pieces of code in a Tiano Core world? Um, well, usually what you would assume is you have one file, one C file, and that tries to uh, call a function, another C file. And usually you would call them, right? Well, not, not so in a normal Tiano Core world, Instead, you go in, ask a UEFI broker, please give me a function pointer to this other entity over there, and then you can runtime link it to actually talk to the other piece of code. And the reason for that is pretty easy. The reason is that you can make block, uh, black boxes. The whole environment is built around the concept of completely different people and teams working on different components, some of them open, some of them proprietary, and the only boundary they have and they're defined against is a, a specification that defines the protocol between two entities. And that's the only boundary you usually have. You never link anything together at link time. You always do it during runtime. Which is very different from U-boot because in U-boot you just link. It is a monolithic, monolithic beast. It basically just means you have one big giant binary at the end that is just fully linked together which makes following code way easier. There are companies that provide proprietary tools just to allow you to potentially even <coughs> remotely debug uh, Tiano core code because everything is an indirect pointer dereference. Everything in their code base. There's one more thing that actually makes those two um, projects very different. Um, that's one thing that uh, got me very attracted to, to the whole UWID de uh, development. And that's if you look at how many boards and systems Tiano Core supports? Well, Tiano Core is the core. It's, it's meant to be the core. And that means you basically have two platforms that Tiano Core actually supports out of the box. With a couple of open source projects that also exist around to enable a few more systems. But you basically are in low two digit numbers of systems that you can build with an open source environment Tiano Core for. If you compare that to U-Boot, um, there are a few more, right? Uh, pretty much every board that's out there is supported by U-Boot. And it's not going to change, it's only going to be more because porting U-Boot is just a lot easier. It's a lot less effort and people know how to do it. It's, we, we have all that knowledge built up in, in the ecosystem. So to summarize, Tiano Core is basically built as a foundation for black box modules. Um, we have Windows coding style and it really is built to fork. The incentive of Tiano Core is we have this core and then everybody who wants to do his own 
firmware needs to fork. They need to fork the whole code base, add their drivers, and, never, and that, that code never flows back into Tiano Core. That's slowly trying to change that model, but it's going to take a while. Uh, whereas Uboot is a, the typical monolithic GPL-ish Linux C environment that you're used to, including coding style and including inclusiveness. So if you write a port to Uboot, Uboot developers are very happy to integrate that into the Uboot public code base and actually encourage you to do so. Now what are UEFI interfaces? Uh, what, 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 how, how do we merge, how do we combine these two, these two worlds? How do we get the UEFI world into the uh, into the UBoot world, and that's actually pretty simple. Uh, in the UEFI world, you have devices. You basically have objects. Um, you have uh, functions you can call on objects, like methods. It, it, it is basically this weird C-based object-oriented thing uh, where uh, every disk drive you have becomes an object, and every network device you can access the network via or through is, is also an object, and then you can call things on them. And funnily enough, we have the same in Uboot. Uboot also has a uh, device model, is what it's called there. It is a C object-oriented uh, version, or a, an object-oriented programming model in C uh, that gives you objects. And all we need to do is if, if we <coughs> link those two together and say, well, we now expose Uboot objects as EFI objects, we don't have to implement drivers in the UEFI world at all. We just reuse the UBoot ones. And all we take from the UEFI spec is the upper shim part that talks to your, our applications, our, our bootloaders, our kernel, all the upper parts. We don't need to take the lower parts that implement drivers. We can if we want to, but why would you even bother? Right? We have a really good a development environment for drivers in UBoot already. And that whole framework that combines those two worlds that, that translates from one to the other, that's called EFI loader in UBoot. And that's uh, what basically got into the code base a few years back. So if you look at the history of how UEFI support in UBoot uh, evolved, it first started off in 2016 when the first UEFI, the EFI loader support, landed in UBoot upstream. So if you have a UBoot version that is anywhere newer than 2016 or 5, you do already support running EFI binaries, even if you don't know it. It just is enabled by default, it just happens to work, and it's completely transparent and seamless to your whole boot flow. It's just yet another binary format that just happens to work. Similar to boot I, boot M, all the other boot mechanisms, we now have boot EFI. The first people adopting it was pretty obvious us, um, because we developed it. So we uh, started to use the UEFI bits in UBoot in our distri distribution for a couple of boards, and we are still not fully finished in converting all boards over to the EFI boot flow. But most of them are running with uh, EFI now. And funnily enough, the ones that followed right after were the OpenBSD people. So the first, the first distro, basically, that was not inventing that whole thing, was that, that used it, was BSD because they had the exact same pain as us. Right? They, they did not want to reinvent the wheel every time for every single board. They wanted to have one interface that just works for everyone, and FreeBSD followed suit pretty soon after. Quite shortly, um, the Fedora guys followed up as well, so if you take a 64-bit Fedora version that runs on SBC, it probably is going to run uh, UBoot with EFI. And a couple months later, we had this really, really fun project, I really like that one, um, where you can now run iPixie on UBoot. Do you know what IPixie is? Mm. Uh, so if you have a PC and you have a network adapter that doesn't have a, an option ROM to boot from that network card, IPixie traditionally was a project that essentially wrote their own option ROMs uh, that make, that basically create DOS drivers for those, um, or not, not just DOS, I guess BIOS drivers, BIOS drivers for uh, specific network cards. But it evolved over time, and there also is an EFI uh, version of it. So now, uh, it basically, this, this, this iPixie is available as a UEFI binary that you can run. And what this UEFI binary does is it consumes a network interface on the UEFI side, and we provide, we provide a UEFI interface. Right? We, we have those available in UBoot, so we can just expose them via the shim all into our uh, UEFI environment, and then this iPixie binary can go in and expose a, an iSCSI disk via this 
network interface that we plug in using UEFI. Now this uh, iSCSI device can then be exposed using a different shim layer into U-boot again. So now it becomes a native U-boot drive, which we can then put U-boot's partition table code onto. So we now have partitions in U-boot from that iSCSI drive that is backed by IPXC, which accesses network protocols using UEFI, where we can run U-boot's file system driver on and load a payload like RUB. So now you can boot from iSCSI in U-Boot without ever writing a single line of iSCSI code inside U-Boot. That's the power of enabling an ecosystem. A couple uh, months later, we, or this year, uh, we gained RISC-V support. So we're <coughs> actually the first official UEFI RISC-V implementation, funnily enough, um, because th there was a project to enable RISC-V in Tiano Core, but it still has not made it out of staging yet. So we actually are the first ones. But, so this is, this is where we're at, um, but where, where are we going next? So there are more things to come. Uh, one of the fun things that we're working on these days is uh, the UEFI shell. So you, this is a screenshot of U-Boot actually running the UEFI shell. Uh, if you've seen that one before, it's basically your debug interface that you usually use in a Tiano Core environment. And that is the exact same binary, just simply running on U-Boot. We just expose the same interfaces that uh, EDK2 exposes. So the same debugging tools that work on your PCs, on your uh, ARM servers, work on embedded systems just the same. There's no, different, no, no, no reason why they wouldn't. And the whole reason we're working on the UEFI shell is actually this. It's the SCT, the System Conformancy Test Suite or whatever it's called, um, which is a framework provided by the UEFI consortium to allow you to test whether your implementation is for officially UEFI compliant. And once we can pass that one, we can claim we are just yet another UEFI implementation. We would actually be the, the first UEFI implementation that was built completely from scratch and is not uh, built around anything EDK2 or Tiano Core, because all of the proprietary ones basically are. And one more thing that is uh, actually landing in upstream right now is Sandbox. Sandbox is a really, really fun project. Sandbox is, um, basically means you can run U-Boot as a Linux binary. So instead of running U-Boot on a board, you can run U-Boot as a Linux binary to prototype and test things. It, it really is mostly me meant as a testing environment. But with Sandbox UEFI support, that means you can now run UEFI binaries in Linux, which can be very useful for things like Linux boot. Right? Imagine you combine this with Linux boot and then you suddenly enable potentially enable running UEFI binaries with Linux actually providing your drivers from your backend. With that, um, let's get to the second half, EBBR. Oh, I need to pick it up. No, that's the wrong one. That was an email. Wait, wait. Got you, just keep talking. <laughs> Alright, so, um, <coughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, the a standard that has gone along with uh, the UBB UEFI work. Um, the slides that I present here are actually the slides that I presented last week at uh, Lamar Connect. So there's a, some stuff in it that will gloss over this Alex has already covered. Um, so uh, I can skip the history of booting because uh, Alex has already covered that fairly well. But the one thing that I do want to highlight on this is that uh, in the embedded space, we you know there's what has happened in PC and what has happened with UEFI. A lot of that stuff has been driven primarily by the economics that there are so many different combinations of systems that just have to work. That the, a lot of the work has gone into the standardization, uh, and so you do have interoperability between operating systems and uh, different Tiano Core UEFI implementations, uh, and with all the so there's things that come out of that, such as PlugFest and the, uh, the UEFI spec and the ATPI spec. On the embedded stage, we've never had quite those same economic incentives. And so while it would be very valuable for us to have some standards and common ways and interoperability on the way things that will work, there isn't the same economic incentives. Uh, so for us in the embedded stage, we have to, that forces us to work harder if you want to get the benefits of having some standardization. 
up looking very much the same. So while we've been kind of allergic in the embedded community to doing standardization because we don't want to get constrained, there aren't any technical barriers to it. Um, also, you know, the, the problem of trying to boot of uh, standards, it's not just a distro problem. In fact, uh, Guy's presentation this morning highlighted exactly the problems that we're having where the embedded systems are getting so complicated uh, that starting with a, a standard base like Debian makes a lot of sense for them because they've got a very well-maintained set of packages and code bases. Everything that we do to make it easier to get uh, an operating system up and running and booting on a platform means there's less work that we have to do on the boring stuff of just booting, and then we can focus on the actual engineering work that needs to be done. So this going, uh, approaching standardization is very much becomes a framework to make it easier to do the kinds of things that we need to do. Uh, and then the standards, anything that isn't standard becomes things that are, go around the kind of the standard behavior of the systems that we want. So the, the goal of standardization here is we want to stop du duplicating the same work. We want to look for the patterns, look for the things that we're doing commonly Im embedded, write them down, say this is how, uh, this is the best way to do it so that we're all play, uh, working from the same playbook. So, the reason I'm standing up here is I'm talking about a new standard called Embedded Base Boot Requirements, uh, or EBBR. And EBBR is the intent to create, oh, I've lost the screen. Alex, you'll, apparently I'm talking too much and not, not uh, keeping the computer alive. There we go, okay. No, I've got to... There it goes. Yeah. Right, so um, now I've lost my place. Embe <laughs> embedded base boot requirements. Uh, so this is a spec that was created to try to collect the stuff that we're doing. And in fact, it's a different kind of spec than we've done before. Instead of going off and saying, we think that we should have this set of interfaces and here you go, embedded community, go off and implement these things. No, we're not gonna do that. The best standards are the ones that come, start from what we're already doing. They start from the, the work that's already done. We take that, we go through the process of discussing it, working out what it needs to be, writing it down and making sure that the spec follows the, uh, follows the technology. So EBBR is intended to be for what it looks like to do a UEFI implementation based on existing open source projects, so that's, that's U-Boot, um, uh, based on existing open source projects that can be implemented now, right? So when we ta start talking about doing the standards, the first thing that we have to decide is what is it that we want to be based on? Uh, and taking a look, I mean, there's lots of firmware projects that are actually important right now in, uh, in the embedded space. So with, we've already talked about U-Boot. There's Little Kernel, there's, uh, which is used by an awful lot of Android devices. Core Boot for Chrome OS. Uh, Alex talked about Tiano Core. There are also um, a number of other firmware projects, which the names escape me at the moment. Uh, and then there's a bunch of related projects that are around it, such as... Um, uh, uh, TFA, or Trusted Firmware. Uh, there's OPT, which is a trusted execution environment. There's quite a few other uh, trusted execution environments out there. Um, and a number of SFC proprietary. So we've had to make some decisions very early on on what it was, what problem we were actually trying to solve. And it made a lot of sense to start with what traditional Linux embe embedded Linux systems look like, which is something that looks very much like a traditional distro, versus as opposed to Android, 
uh, U-Boot, which we've already got a healthy project around, and there was already all the work going on within U-Boot to implement UEFI. So that seemed like the, the place to start because we can't boil the ocean. There is uh, certainly a lot of value in doing the same sort of work in the other firmware projects because we think that um, uh, having those standards and having that common way to boot is actually pretty common. It's, if we're talking about Android, we'll want to look at that uh, at some point in the future, but right now it's focused on what can be done right now in your day-to-day -day work. What, is, what projects are already available, not what has to be done if we go off and do six months or a year of work, then we'll be able to come up with a standard. No, no. The standard goes along with what has already been implemented and available. So the, what it is, it is, uh, we're viewing it as a, a platform requirements document. Uh, I had to change this slide because Alex took the XKCD comic that I had on it. Uh, the intent is not to create a new standard. We're not creating something brand new, which is yet another standard that needs to be followed. Uh, this document is more in terms of a platform requirements document. If you're familiar with the Windows world, Microsoft does something very similar that the Microsoft says, you need to match these features from the other specifications if you want to be supported in the Windows ecosystem. This is very much the same thing. This is a roll-up document that collects all the standards and the, uh, that, are needed to be, that you need to pay attention to, and then the implementation choices that go along with that. The other thing that's different with eBBR is, um, oh, so uh, and it's also the baseline that the distros can support. So in uh, this entire process, it's been focused on embedded, but it has been very much driven by the distros. So Suze has been heavily involved. Red Hat has been involved. Um, we've got um, folks showing up from um, FreeBSD, Debian, and uh, the, the doors are open basically for everyone. But it's, this is something that needs to work for the existing distros. Uh, to do that, we're doing something very different. This is very different for ARM at the specification level because we're doing this with an open project. Uh, instead of going and doing what ARM likes to do, which is go talk to all our partners, go talk to all of you, say, what do you want? And then we go away and then we write some stuff and then we come back and say, is this what you wanted? And then usually the answer is no and we might go back and change it, but uh, there's the iterative process. In this case, we're doing something very different, which is rather than starting with something that ARM holds the pen on and everything, we're using a completely open license. So we're starting with Creative Commons, the by SA license, so it's share alike. Uh, we are putting everything that goes for the document into GitHub. The conversations are on the mailing list, contributions through uh, developer certificate of origin, so DCO, and anyone can participate. So it looks just like any other open source project. Only difference is this is a document instead of um, a code base. Uh, and the other thing that we felt was really important with this is that this is architecture independent. Uh, right now, so ARM owns this specification, but we're not tying this to the ARM architecture. And in fact, there's been a fair bit of interest from, uh, from other architecture. RISC-V in particular has, um, has participated a bit with this. The intent with this spec is to set a baseline for what it is for embedded firmware, regardless of which architecture. Uh, right now, the, doc the document has ARCH32 support in it, or sorry, ARCH64, and ARCH32 support, uh, a patch has been written. Uh, any other patches for, to add other architectures are more than welcome. Uh, it's also actually implementation independent. So as I've talked about, while I've talked about U-Boot, the, the EBBR doesn't say anything about how you actually implement it. And this is very much by design. So while drafting, it's certainly thinking about what we're following, what has been implemented in the project already. But that doesn't mean we have to specify you must do it this way. Uh, so in actual fact, uh, while EBBR is focused on U-Boot, Tiano Core is also a compatible implementation because it's just all exactly the same interfaces. It just sets that baseline. And it sets the baseline as something that is suitable for embedded and for, for the embedded products. Uh, we already talked about, Alice already talked about the UEFI ABI. Um, the other thing that goes into this document is additional platform guidance of you know, kind of the design choices that you really should be making on embedded. And this is where uh, 
things are going to be a little bit different from what you see on, on the desktop market. Um, so for example, with embedded systems, one of the big complaints about UEFI has been UEFI has runtime services. Runtime services are services that the firmware provides that can be called by the operating system at runtime. And those are kind of painful to deal with. Because the moment you've got runtime services, it means that you've got a part of your firmware running in the context of your operating system. How do you actually do that? How do you do that if your firmware wants to go and write to Flash that your Linux kernel currently actually owns and is running its file system off of? Uh, if firmware tries to go and touch that, you're going to get corruption, you're going to get uh, colliding uh, transactions. So EBBR talks about the design decisions that you would make if you were building on such constrained systems. Uh, one of the examples is variable services. So if you're trying to write a variable, you may not be able to do that. So EBBR says, this is what you do if you can't write variables at runtime. Uh, we also talk about uh, the things like when you're dealing with EMMC uh, and you've got both firmware and your operating system and possibly some, some low-level boot firmware all sitting on the same device. How to actually manage that device and share it so that you're not walking, uh, trampling over each other. Uh, the project is uh, hosted on GitHub. Uh, you can, I mean, here's the details right here. You can um, go and find it and make use of, or join the project, join the mailing list. Uh, there's a weekly conference call. Um, I've already talked about the, how the project is licensed. Um, and status, it's, um, so right now, where we're at is the document's at version uh, 0.6. Uh, that's a pre-release draft. Uh, the intent is to f uh, finalize the first version of it, uh, 1.0, by the end of the year. Um, we're going to have a, a, dot, a 0.7 pre-release in the next couple of weeks, and the intent is to circulate around you and other people in the community so that we can get some feedback before um, uh, at ELCE and also at Linux Plumbers Conference. Um, and that's EBBR. Uh, for the future, we've got, um, in, the in this first release, we're expecting to have uh, ARC32 and ARC64 as a minimum. Uh, the UEFI ABI, we're, oh, one of the things that will affect you is uh, we've, having that hardware description. In a lot of the embedded products, we tend to like to put the device tree with the kernel. Uh, one of the things that we're pushing for in eBBR and becomes really important when it comes to standardization on booting these platforms is start putting the device tree or the ACPI tables directly into firmware and actually managing those in firmware because that solves so many problems when it comes to booting. Uh, for the distributions, it becomes, it's completely unsupportable if the firmware does not provide some level of uh, hardware description to, uh, uh, to the operating system. Uh, so that's one of the requirements that are in there. Uh, there's guidance on shared storage. Uh, PSCI is required on ARC64, so we've got some requirements in there that talk about how you actually power manage the system. Um, the runtime services guidance, and then anything that we are exceptions to the UEFI spec. Now, as I said, that this is we're not trying to create a new spec, so all the stuff that's going on here is also related to what's going on in the U UEFI spec as well. Uh, something that has been very positive in the last few years is the UEFI forum has become very welcome to input from the, from the Linux community. Uh, so the work that's going on in EBBR, we've got uh, people on the EBBR committee who are also on the UEFI committee, and changes that we need to the main spec are also getting, uh, getting done. Um, Next steps. So this is where e EBBR becomes uh, interesting and the, the new things that it enables. Uh, if you view specifications as that framework for, for doing common things, one of the things that we haven't been particu particularly good at is uh, how you do security, how you do the frameworks for signed images and updates and being consistent across the different kinds of platforms that we have. Um, once we get that first release, the next things that we're going to start looking at are things like secure boot and capsule updates and having some common mechanisms for doing things that, are, that, that we do need in the, the embedded world. Uh, but being able to handle it, that is more of the embedded use cases, such as doing AB updates, uh, doing pre-boots, you know, being able to 
what kind of applications we need to run in the preboot environment. And then better UFI compliance and more non-Linux representation from folks like the BSDs. Uh, oh, and the, there is no Demo Friday. I apologize for that. That's the slide I forgot to delete. Um, so thank you very much for, that, for listening to my much drier presentation than uh, Alex. Um, questions? We've got the mic. Behind you. Uh, I will be back to the first slide of Alexander. Um, you, one of the issues we see today is a lack of implication of the vendors into making the board being bootable uh, out of the box. Do you have any uh, feedback with EBBR from the vendors which are much more interested to help uh, making the board being much likely bootable when they are sold out? So I sold. think. I think I removed that one slide um, that showed who is part of EBBR. I had one somewhere buried deep down there. Well, so at least gets you an idea uh, on, on who is already uh, working on EBBR today. Right? So these are all the companies that These are all the companies that you, you can find today um, participating in the EBBR discussions. Uh, you see NXP, you see TI, you see Zardings. Mm -hmm. We already have a few of the hardware partners around. The idea is, I mean, a lot of these, we're talking about changing a whole ecosystem, right? That is, that is going the way it is because that was the least way of resistance. What we're trying to do is we're trying to change the resistance path and that's not going to happen overnight. We need to have EBBR 1.0 out before some of the bigger ones do jump in. But if a few companies drive it and it becomes a monetary incentive to support EBBR because you're just ignoring other platforms because they're not compliant, then we at least have an angle. So from a distro point of view, what we can do, for example, is uh, we can, as soon as EBBR 1.0 is, is, is there, we can say, we can support your SOC only if you, or your board, only if you support EBBR. If you don't do EBBR, don't even talk to us, which then again gives them an incentive to do it because usually, I mean, at least a good number of those embedded SOC vendors these days want to go, want, want to have an enterprise distro because that gives them 13 years of security updates, which happens to be important these days. So uh, we, we are creating the incentives for them. It doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. Thank you. We're, we're also working with the um, hardware specs, uh, or with things like 96 boards. The 96 board specs are looking to adopt EVBR as part of the base requirements on what you do if you want to build one of those boards. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have a, a few questions. And my first question would be with regards to um, architecture independence. You mentioned Rix5, for instance. Yes. But then you mentioned that your spec uh, mandates PSCI, which is an ARM. On AR32, it does. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. That's, so there, there are a few little bits that end up being okay. architecture dependent. And mm -hmm. to do that in a spec is fine, but we just label it. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. So, like AR32, well, we don't have any specifications on there because. AR32 is all over the map. Okay. And I have another question with regards to uh, moving the device tree tables or SCPI uh, yep. tables into the firmware. How do you intend to handle the, the moving ABI target? For instance, you have a new device tree we nodes. Need to stop. We, we need to stabilize the ABI. Yeah, it's but time. When, when you're working in embedded, you have a first prototype with yep. the already running yes. distro, and then you need to update. So you update your bootloader at the same time. You, you, do, you do the prototyping before you stabilize your device tree ABI. So basically, what, what the, the wording of the first of, of EBBR 1.0 is going to be that you basically have an upstream tag. So there, there's going to be a special tag in the device that says this device tree is EBR compliant. And once you have that, 
upstream changes will forbid any forwards or backwards incompatible changes. You will not be able to do any of them, which means if you add that tag, it needs to be a conscious, conscious decision yeah. that you're now going to be compatible until eternity. Yeah. Now, it's, it's important to note, though, that doesn't mean you can't change the device tree and you can't change the bindings. In fact, we know how to do this. There's, a, there's enough evidence on how to do bindings in a way that remains forward compatible. Uh, so what it means, we need to be better at that, at actually doing that. And then in the mainline kernel, any changes that break booting, that cause failures or call regressions, those have to be treated as bugs, just like we treat regressions in user space as bugs. Now, I'm talking about the mainline kernel here. Right? I'm talking about the yeah. standard on the mainline kernel. I'm talking about the standard that's required for the distros to be able to actually support a platform. Uh, if you're doing an embedded product and the, the regular iterative development in there, you're not going to be constrained by that in the same way because at development, I mean, you're, you're hacking together patches already to work out, okay, well, what actually needs to be here? So it's not a slam down the first thing that you write is set in stone. There's, yeah. You've got quite a bit of flexibility. And it really, the the first target that we're trying to solve is that mainline kernel, that distro ecosystem of being able to get beyond the single board, single vertically integrated software stack every single time. Right? That's okay. unsustainable. Thank you. I have a last question. Yeah. Um, you talked about uh, software independence. You mentioned Tianocore and U-Boot. Yes. Have you looked at other uh, firmware that would implement the same spec, like uh, Bearbox or uh, SES? So we, talked to, we talked to the Bearbox people. Yeah. Um, they are definitely open in integrating the EFI loader code. It probably would take a Bearbox developer about a week to just copy the code from you and integrate yeah. it. Yeah. They just uh, didn't do it yet because Bearbox is traditionally uh, used in uh, Pangotronics only projects, which means they don't care that much because yeah. they don't have the issue because they just want to have even more vertical integration. That's the whole reason they do bare box. Yeah. Right? Um, whereas this is trying to solve the problem that you as an embedded developer get a board in your hands and that just, I mean, you don't want to spend two months until it actually works. Yeah. You want to boot it up and just have it running so that you can start working on real things and not the boot flow that really nobody cares yeah. about. It's not a value add for anyone. Yeah. So, next question, I've got a giveaway board that I'm supposed to give out. But I, I already have you one. already have one. Then, then your neighbor gets one. Um, device tree overlay? Yes. Have you considered that? Uh, device tree overlay outs. Uh, in the strictest sense, device tree overlays are out of scope. Okay. Uh, in that the interface that's being defined is when you get out of firmware and into the OS, there is a description of what the platform is. Um, so it's not going to be covered in the EVBR spec, at least not initially. However, all of that work, so all the functionality of do, applying the device tree overlays for that to be in U-boot and that be part of the boot flow, uh, that's completely in frame. That, that's, you can absolutely do that. And in fact, the way that we handle device tree with um, uh, UEFI is there's um, in the, well, I've forgotten the name of the table. There's a device uh, table. table. Just, just, so yeah. basically what you have in, it's, in EFI it's, is, in new EFI <clears throat> is you have a, a pointer to just a big data structure yep. that contains a couple of more pointers. And one of the pointers is a tables reference. And that's just an array of a lot of different, they call yep. it tables in new EFI. You would call it random data structures normally. Uh, and that's where UEFI usually stores the ACPI tables. It's where, where it stores SM BIOS tables too, for example. Yeah. Um, and that's where we also store the device tree table, which actually has been there for years now already, even in yeah. Tiano core-based versions. Well, one of the neat things, one of the nice things that that allows you to do is because UEFI, it's not just about booting the OS. There's a runtime API there. Uh, for example, Grub runs on, on that. Uh, but if you need to do device tree manipulations, like if you need to make a decision about which overlays to apply, that binary doesn't have to be part of uBoot. That can be run, loaded, run at runtime before jumping into Grub and running your, uh, or jumping into the kernel UEFI stub. Maybe it can be loaded at Linux at runtime. It can be loaded at Linux, but that's also out of scope, right? Because if you've got overlays and you're just deciding to wait for Linux to boot before you do that, firmware doesn't care. Right. So it, it's deliberately out of scope. Yeah. Or it's deliberately not mentioned because it, 
there can be multiple levels. So for one, one example is the Raspberry Pi again. I just know that one because I happen to maintain that. Um, where on recent U-Boot versions, you can just tell U-Boot, go and use the device tree passed in from the, from, from, from the firmware that runs before U-Boot. And so you have one single device tree that trickles all the way down. You have that device tree that the proprietary firmware takes that adapts uh, itself based on that. Then you have U-Boot that adapts itself based on that same description. Then you have that one passed into Linux, which again, we use the same device tree. And if yeah. you want to add overlays, you don't add overlays in, in any of the interim ones, but you add them on the topmost layer, which basically in the Raspberry world is your config text. Mm -hmm. You just say add this overlay and it propagates all the way down. Yeah. Any other questions? Duh. Don't kill him. Uh, will you be storing multiple device trees or just one single device you tree on implementation, the Well, there's, there's always only one device tree in the table. Okay. Whether your board or your, your firmware has multiple to choose from is implementation defined. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's expected the, the firmware will, will make that decision. The spec says it will provide one, right? So by the time you get to the kernel, firmware will have already made a decision on which one to use. Okay. Any other? How are we doing on time? Good. No. Yeah, that's one more. <laughs> Thanks. No. Yeah. Um, like, uh, I have a feeling that we, we go more and more smart at the firmware level of, uh, it's not only booting, but sometimes adding uh, features and things like that. Uh -huh. And uh, a little like uh, UFE in um, PC World, yeah. you are not afraid that it's uh, pushed to more lock-in and uh, things like that. Because what you say is no, someone could say, okay, uh, we respect the spec, yeah. so we give you the, the bootloader uh, blob mm -hmm. that um, does everything that is needed, and uh, you, it's enough for you to uh, to be just on the higher uh, higher level. Mm -hmm. um, on another point, is that uh, maybe something that uh, some hardwares that have to be controlled at higher level will be more controlled at lower level uh, with more secrecies, and I, I think for something like. Uh, uh, Thunderbolt, for example, Thunderbolt, there's two cases sometimes. Um, like, uh, um, the, sometimes it can be initialized by, uh, by hardware uh, mm -hmm. at low, low level, and uh, it's hard for the system to control it because it doesn't, uh, it's not easy able to manage it. And, uh, and on some way, it can be the Linux uh, system that controls the Thunderbolt uh, controllers and uh, but so if you have the lower level that is too, too intelligent, too capable, and uh, nicely made to, to act like a black box, that it can be uh, an issue for... Um, okay, so, so there are two, two answers to that. The first is, uh, how is that different from today? Right? Look, look at a random Qualcomm platform. You, you're not even starting in hypervisor mode. They, they put their own DRM checking framework into hypervisor so that you only use it for authenticated workloads. Right? Yeah. Uh, it can't get worse than that, um, even with standards. Uh, the other one is, um, so that, well, that, that basically goes, goes hand in hand. Uh, I would encourage you to vote with your feet on decisions like that. Um, and that's what most people will do, hopefully. Uh, it's one of the big problems that I've seen is that embedded people in general are, are always afraid of putting things into firmware because they don't control firmware, right? <laughs> Which I completely sympathize with. But the solution to that problem is not to put less in firmware because sometimes firmware is the right place to just put these bits. It's to make firmware open, yeah. right? You, you want to force people to simply have open firmware. You want to have an open ATF for your platform. You don't want to be locked into a random proprietary stack that runs five megabytes of stuff before your code starts, yeah. which is the core conversion. So, so a, good, a good example of that is the Linux boot project, where the Linux boot, a bunch of the work that they're doing right now is taking a binary firmware implementation, EFI, 
disassembling it, taking, figuring out which pieces, because it's the modular system, you can take out modules, replace it with a module that then boots the kernel, um, and then do the things that they need to, to boot. Um, the, they're doing that because they have to, right? That's, they've got hardware, they've got lockdown firmware, that's the only option that they have. For all of the kinds of platforms that we're, that we're talking about, we control the firmware source, right? We control U-Boot. Uh, so there's a, a certain element of you don't have to, you know, if, if you've got a project and if we make sure that the firmware uh, stacks are open source, a lot of those problems fall away. But for, for example, like for graphic cards, for example, mm -hmm. the more you go in uh, firmware, the more it's easy to, um, to lock in and keep in secret. And uh, even it's, if it's less performant when it's on, um, more on the user space side, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's harder to have uh, like a proprietary or, or patents or things like that. So I, I fully agree. And yep. we, we're, trying, we're trying pretty hard to not enable too many of those use cases. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, so while we can execute UEFI applications with eBBR, we say nothing about UEFI drivers. So we deliberately don't allow option ROMs to get executed. Yeah. Maybe someone will want to do it eventually sometime down the road because it's just very hard to change some of the markets. Yeah. But at least for embedded, I don't see that problem too big today. Um, if, as, lo as long as people realize that proprietary software is just simply a big support issue. I, I know of at least one industrial, really big industrial vendor that is active in core boot simply because they don't, do not want to have any login into proprietary code because they have to support their devices for 20 years. And well, good luck support, like fi finding the, the, the person that can fix your 20 year old code when the time comes, when the 2038 issue comes along or something, right? Um, there, it, it will, I, I do hope that people will see the light more, but eBBR is not going to change that in either direction. Yeah. All right. And yes. we're out of time. Well so, then. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.